class, we were looking at this uh, response surface, and we had done some detailed calculations on showing how we went from our baseline to step five and to step six. We ended up looking at the end of the class at exploring the neighborhood around step six. We've discovered some deficiencies in our model already at step five. So we could have arguably put our factorial around this 0.5 and done the work we're going to do now instead of around 0.6. But here we've, got, we've, got, we've done that experiment, we're at 0.6. The decision was then made to do a factorial in that neighborhood to explore the region around 6. And I left the class on the last time showing where those y values were. So at the baseline of this new factorial, so 0.6, I've got a profit of 680. There's my four other profit values at the corner that's around um, 0.6. And we'd say that we took out a step to 0.12 over there based on the, the least squares model. So what I just wanted to do is go through that again uh, very quickly, but also show you how you can do that quite efficiently using R. So the other step also that I wanted to, to talk about is already we can investigate some of the curvature in the neighborhood of 0.6. And the way to do this, whenever you're drawing a response surface, is to map some contours on the Q plot for yourself. So if we write at our center point, there's a plot of 688, and then standard order around, I guess, 694, 7.5, Top left at 620, and then top right at 642. So those are the five experiments that I have available to you. And as we did before, you should always plot some contours on here for yourself. And you can quite quickly see the curvature. Here we know what the reality is. Unfortunately, this is a bit of an artificial situation, so we can see the curvature. But you can actually see it already here on this particular plot. Take a look at the following. Here's 0.688 in the center. This range on the left, on the right hand side, is about 80 units, and 680 is roughly over here. Also on this axis, 680 is round about over here. So all these points will be connected on the contour, indicating we've got some curvature over there. 694 is over here, 694 would just be below this point, and 694 would be roughly here. So again, got some curvature. 700, oh, sorry, yeah. and then 642 as well, you can show that it would be something like that. So even without computer software, without even knowing the reality of the system, we can already start to see that there's some curvature in the neighborhood where we are. Let me show you how you can do that in, in R. Um, there's some, um, this code is all posted on the website. So here's my factorial minus one plus one in T and S, my five values of profit in, in the order over here. In, in fact, in my code, I put my baseline at the end, so 00688 corresponds to this first experiment on the table over here. Doesn't matter, as long as you're consistent. Let's build that linear model. And we get then a summary of the model, which we saw uh, last time. We've got one degree of freedom, five experiments estimating four parameters, and there's um, my intercepts and my slopes. Now what's more important is this to visualize that. Um, so I've, this code we saw last time and it's posted on the website. We create a, re a surface plot using the contour plot function from the lattice library. And if I run that code over here, we gen generate a plot of that form. So there we go. We can start to see that curvature here in the plot with the four corner points marked out there in red. And just to emphasize that, that curvature, that curvature comes from the interaction term. It's the only source of curvature here. Let me refit this for you and prove that to you. If I go to this model, I'm fitting Y described by T plus S plus the TS interaction. If I take that two-factor interaction out and I run that code again, 
and draw the contour plot, you'll just simply get straight lines along that. So there my contours are now all straight because I'm ignoring the two-factor interaction. So that very minor two-factor interaction actually has quite a bit of an effect on the model. Let me go add it back and let's go look at it numerically again. So just run this code with the two-factor interaction added back and we take a look at the summary of that model. The two-factor interaction is only minus 2.25. Compared to the main effects of 13.25 and minus 39, this interaction seems to be small, minus 2.25. But you can already see in the contour plot visualization of it, when we add it in, it, it does show and clearly emphasize to us that we're in a neighborhood where something quite substantially different is taking place than just linear behavior. Okay, so um, we must add when we've got our, our two-factor interactions, we should plot our surfaces with it included because they're going to guide us in a more sensible direction than just assuming a linear direction. Okay, so, so that's important. The other important uh, point I wanted to show with you in the computer software is last class we had estimated that our next experiment, experiment 12, was down here. So we, we said we were going to head in this direction and that we call experiment 12. Important always to get a prediction of what we expect to happen at point 12 before we even run it. So we use, that, we use our model and we can show that y hat for experiment 12, last class I wrote down a value on the board that was incorrect. This is the correct one, $811. So please update your notes. Um, I forget what I used, but it was the 700 and something was incorrect. The actual y went 767, so ignore that and, and use 811, that's the correct one. The actual y, when we run our experiment at that location, is 716. So, $716 here for experiment. So whenever you get a new experimental data point, update your contour plots right away. We've got a new, a new experiment that we've just run. I can go add and improve my contour plots. Here's 716. This point over here is 725, so 716 is going to be somewhere over here. 716 on this horizontal axis is going to be roughly over here. So it's indicating for me that I've got something like this happening. Okay, so again, coming back to that analogy of a blind person walking, we've just put very expensively, uh, and we've done a new experiment, it's cost us a lot of money to run these experiments. Let's use that single new data point and improve my model, and improve my understanding of the situation around me. Quickly showing me that I've got this curvature happening, and I can already guess that this optimum, instead of going in this direction, which I supposed was my, my optimum, I can quite quickly see that an improved direction is going to be something more along over here. I need to change t, this t direction, this is my t variable and this is my s variable. I had changed my s direction quite substantially relative to my t direction. What it's saying to me, this revised contour, is that I should rather be going something a little bit more in that diagonal direction. Okay, so in fact, if you recall, experiment 12 was constructed by saying delta xs over delta xt. That's equal to the slope coefficient for the s divided by the slope coefficient for t, and that was minus 39 over 13 for my least squares model. I got that. That implies, in other words, I'm taking for every step I change xt by one unit, I need to change xs by three units. Let's just visualize that here quickly. It says that if I'm borrowing xt. I've increased by plus one units, so that's delta xt. It says to change delta xs by minus three units. So what I've done then is essentially changed delta x 
xs by negative three units relative to this baseline. So my baseline is that zero, zero, one, two. I've got a one unit increase in xt and then a three unit decrease in xs. That's how I ran experiment 12. Once I run it, however, I'm seeing, well, hang on, there's this huge difference in profit between what I expect, y hat 12, versus y 12 actual. $100 difference. That $100 difference is huge. If we go back and recall our least squares model had main effect of 13 for T, a main effect of negative 40 for S. So to be off by $100 is we're off by about two and a half times the main effect of S. That's pretty substantial in the game my model is going to So that's typical of when we're, when we're starting to approach an optimum. Our models uh, don't work out quite as well anymore. And we need to start updating our models and adding more sophistication to them. So what we call this in response to this method is we recognize we've got curvature. So curvature then curvature is a sign we are approaching the optimum. That's a nonlinear term, but it's not sufficient to capture how the system is behaving in that neighborhood. I need to add some greater amount of nonlinearity. So what we do is we move to what's called central composite designs to add nonlinearity to our model. superimpose it onto your existing design and get your nonlinear information. So this is what a central composite design looks like. So we take our existing factorial, there's my in two variables, I've run those four experiments and I've run the baseline. And a central composite design adds what is called star points. We go add a point just out here in the middle of the first variable. So this is my t variable. I added t equals zero, but I added this distance we call alpha down from the center point of the second variable x. The next star point to add is over here, also a distance alpha out over there. And this time it is at zero of s, but at alpha units out from the base. And then I add my third star point and my fourth star point. Every one of these are in distance alpha away from the center. And alpha is equal to f to the point 25. f is equal to the number of points in your full factorial. Okay, so in this case, um, f is equal to 4. So alpha is equal to 1.41. If we were in dealing with the response surface strategy with three variables, 
that alpha would be slightly larger at 1.7. And the reason for that number is it's seemingly like, well, where does this come from? George Box showed back in the 1950s that that ratio alpha leads to what's called a rotatable design. If you actually look at this design, those points are all roughly the same distance out. Means that no matter which direction you're going to move in, you're going to have the direction that leads to lowest variance. Okay, so you're going to build a model that in every direction around you, from the center point, your estimate of the model is going to have the lowest variance possible. And that's a good thing, because we don't know ahead of time which direction we're going to head into. We don't know if our option is going to be in that direction or in this direction. So what we want is a model that no matter which direction we will go into afterwards, our model estimate has the lowest variance possible no matter which direction. So that ratio then will guarantee that result. So let's take a look at uh, the central composite design back in this example. What it means then is we have to go add those star points shown over here. So I add point experiment 13, 14, 15, and 16. So I've labeled them in that order, but we would run them in random order. You don't run them sequentially in that sequence. You pick a random order, but those are the numbering you have at the end. So I, I go and add those additional four points, and I go build a revised model now, a new least squares model, that contains those nine observations. So four factorial observations plus one center point plus my four star points gets me nine data points. So nine parameters, sorry, nine data points. I could estimate nine parameters. I won't estimate nine parameters, though. What I will do, though, is estimate a model as follows, where we add nonlinear terms. We're going to estimate a model now that's y is b0 plus btxt plus the bsxs due to the substrate, our two-factor interaction, ETS, XTS, XS. We're going to add two new terms to this model. So only two extra terms. We call this BTT, XT squared. So I add the quadratic effect of temperature. What is the quadratic effect of temperature now on my model? And what is the quadratic effect of substrate? So BSS, XS squared. So I've got nine data points, one, two, three, four, five, six parameters. I'm going to have three degrees of freedom left over afterwards. Just no confidence as well. So now the reason why central composite designs work so well is we know that if we want to estimate a quadratic model, we need three data points. Right? We know that from our prior courses. If I want to estimate a quadratic model, I need three data points and I can fill a quadratic curve. So if we look back at factorial design, that would imply that I had to do experiments. If I wanted to estimate a quadratic model in this left or the right direction, I would need to do three experiments. One, two, three. And I could fit the quadratic term for that horizontal direction. If I wanted to fit a quadratic term in this vertical direction, I would do one, two, three experiments. And then I could go re-estimate those quadratic terms by running those additional points. Okay, so I could go run those nine data points and estimate a quadratic model, but this model will not have the efficiencies that this uh, center composite design has. The center composite design has these three data points lined up in a row, as we can see. So there's one, two, three data points in a row. We also have these data points in a row. But then, instead of going adding additional points, we, we may retain our original factorial and choose only those, those additional data points. So it is a more efficient way to get the same model out, but with lower variance. Okay, so let's take a look at how you set that up in R or in MATLAB if you're wanting to calculate x transpose as inverse x transpose y. There's my beta vector of slope coefficients I wish to estimate. So the first column in the x matrix must all be ones corresponding to the intercept. That's those over there. The second column corresponds to the values to estimate the temperature slope. So there's minus, plus, minus, plus, and a zero for the baseline. Now let's take a look at points, experiments 13, 14, 15, and 16. So this was experiment 13. 
14, 15, and 16. So for experiment 13, my temperature variable is actually at zero. So that zero there is due to the fact that experiment 13 is run just below my baseline, so temperature is still at zero. Substrate for experiment 13, on the other hand, is at minus alpha units down from the baseline. So minus alpha units down from the baseline in the substrate's uh, vertical direction. So that's the minus 1.41 there. The fourth column corresponds to the BTS interaction. Well, that's just zero times minus 1.41 gets me zero. The BTT column, this fifth column, corresponds to the temperature XT multiplied by XT. So that's zero times zero gets me zero. And then the final column is two, corresponds to XS times XS. So minus 1.41 times minus 1.41 gets me plus two. So those, that X matrix is set up in, in the same way we've set up our X matrices in the past. The only difference is now we get these four points over there at plus or minus alpha, and then we get these plus or minus two is occurring to use the quadratic terms. So let's take a look at, at what this third uh, microtyping are. Again, this, this code is posted there for, for you to, to try out. So what we now go do for our simple composite experiments is we take my t vector and s vector that I had before, minus, plus, minus, plus, and zero, and I add in those additional terms, zero, square root of two, zero, minus square root of two. Same for s. And y, I just put my profit values that I record when I run the experiments at those start points. My model now is a little bit different. My model says, estimate for me y, described by T plus S plus the two-factor interaction Ts plus the S squared term and the T squared term. And we surround that with the I operator in, in R. We've, we've seen the I operator before. Well, that tells R to explicitly interpret this as is. It's also called the as is operator. So we want an S squared term and a T squared term. So let's take a look at what that does if we run that model. I just want to run the model, get the summary and the confidence intervals from it. So, so this revised model now has a new intercept. The temperature effect is the same value, plus 13. The substrate effect is the same value, minus 39. Here's the substrate quadratic effect, is minus 12. The temperature effect is, the quadratic effect of temperature is minus 4, and then there's my two-factor interaction. The confidence intervals show me what you can see there numerically as well, that temperature is significant, so it does not span zero. The substrate effect is not is significant. The, two, the quadratic effect of substrate is significant, minus 16 to minus 7. So that um, is a significant factor. The t squared confidence interval, however, just barely um, is, is insignificant from minus 8 to plus 0.1. So I would still retain my temperature quadratic effect in the model. This is only just barely insignificant from a statistical point of view. From a practical point of view, I would retain it. And then my two-factor interaction is, is fairly insignificant. Yeah, John. Um, what is the S squared interaction? It's the, uh, in the physical sense, it's the quadratic effect of, of substrate. So, there isn't really a way we can interpret this from a first principles point of view. We're building what are called empirical models to match reality. So we're adding, we've got a linear term, Bs. Then we're adding the two-factor interaction, Bts. Those we can interpret, but then we also add quadratic effects and cubic effects maybe. You can't interpret that from a first principles point of view. But it's going to improve the fit of the model. You're going to make your model fit the data that you have more accurately by adding these nonlinear terms. So let's visualize what that quadratic model looks like. If I go and use the same contour plot code as before, I get a surface now that looks something along this, those lines. So there's my, my factorial with the start points. And that quadratic 
term now has the quadratic terms in S and the quadratic terms in temperature have added that curvature. That's now substantial. And it actually matches, notice here quite carefully how, it, or notice how it matches quite closely what I drew by hand just from these original points. I'm starting to see that my optimum is somewhere more over here than down there where I originated. Uh, now this code that's on the course website has a parameter that you can adjust for yourself to make those, those lines a little bit closer spaced. So right now it's face, facing them every 20 units of the foot apart. If I would like them a little closer together, just change cuts up here to a higher number so it will use a, a greater number of contours. But the reason why I'm doing that is because when we get to nonlinear models, there is no more way we can go use our regular, um, I cannot go use this approach that I, I did over here to decide where to run my next experiment. So here we used, when we've got a linear model, I go up one unit of BS for every unit I go up in BT. Well, for a nonlinear model where my nonlinear coefficients are significant, I cannot say that anymore. <coughs> The only way I can use a nonlinear model is to visually plot it and then decide I'm going to run my next experiment right there. So my next experiment, I simply, I don't go look at it analytically anymore as I did before. I just go look at it here on the contour plot. I will go run my next experiment in coded units at temperature of plus two and substrate concentration of minus 1.6, I'd say, or something along those lines, somewhere over there. So, sorry, not minus 1.6, minus 1.9. So that seems to be the optimum for me. So let's just take a look at that. We work through that final example. So the key, the key with CCD designs is you know, the next experiment is eyeballed from the from the not, not that okay, so you must be able to use this contour plotting code effectively to judge where to run the next experiment because that's the only way you can do it. So in this example, XT17, my 17th and hopefully final experiment that I run will be at plus two encoded units and XS encoded units would be minus 1.9. If we take our regular approach to scale that back into real world units, so remember we had that formula in the class last time, to connect us between our coded units and real world units. If you apply that, you can show quite easily for yourself that your next step for temperature is XT17 in coded units multiplied by the range of T over 2 plus the center of T. So XT encoded units multiplied by the half range and add back your center point. That corresponds to plus two. The range we used last time was eight Kelvin divided by two. The center point we used for that factorial was in real world units of 335. So that means my next experiment is a run at 343 Kelvin in the temperature. Repeat the same calculation again, this time for substrate. The 17th experiment you can show for yourself at home would be at right 1.6 grams. So we have to then implement that next experiment. And I choose to run it where I estimate that optimum to be unscaled to real world units. And before I actually run the experiment though, what I should do is predict 
where I'm going to be. This time now, I use this new nonlinear model to make that prediction. Okay, so I, again, here's some code that shows how to do that quite efficiently. So rather than doing this by hand and making mistakes, let's let the computer do this for us. So the way we do it, we do it in coded units, create a data frame with temperature specified at 2, <coughs> specify my substrate at minus 149, so create a, a new data point. Let's call that next dot 17. So let's just run that line and take a look at what it looks like. Next dot 17 is a vector with two entries, T and S, at plus 2 and minus 1.9 respectively. So if I feed that into my least squares model, Using the predict function you've seen uh, a few weeks ago when you were doing the least square section of the course, um, you used this predict function. So using the quadratic model, mod.quad, feed in this new data point and give me the predicted y value. And it's $736. So y hat 17. $736. Y actual 17 is equal to 738. Okay, so that model with the quadratic effects added now is so, so accurate. We're only off by $2 when we actually go run our experiment this our prediction. That gives me another guarantee that that uh, quadratic model was effective. Another way you can see it is here I've superimposed for you the quadratic model in red, and you can see how closely they match the contour lines of the tree that we don't really know. So that optimum I predicted over here, I am off by just a little bit. Okay, and in fact that profit right at the peak is 738. Here I'm sorry, this profit, the actual profit over here is 738. I have predicted 736. So I'm not much, not much off. The true peak is at about $741. So I'm, this current optimum that I'm, I'm choosing to operate at is pretty close to the reality. I'm pretty close to the true optimum. Okay, so. The final, the final steps then in the response to this method that we must be clear on is, well, how do we know when to stop? So let's just uh, make a few notes on that. Uh, it's actually quite straightforward. You, you stop. When your curvature is large or substantial, that makes sense because an optimum must be at, at a region where there's curvature. You stop when all the points around you are lower. So if I am at the optimum already, everything else is going to be below me. If I'm trying to minimize something, everything else is going to be above me. So either way, all points around your current optimum are worse off. Well, the contour plots will, will tell you. So, so any one of those mechanisms will inform you that you're, you're close to an optimum. should also try to understand is, well, what's going to happen if one of my variables that I'm optimizing against, A, B, C, for example, what if one of them is a binary variable? Binary variables, we cannot change in the way we've done here. Temperature and substrate are continuous, easy to change and, and move around. But binary variables, by their nature, only have two levels. So let's take a look at, at a conceptual example of that. Let's assume I've got three factors, 
A, B, and C. And B, let, let's make B the binary variable. right here in the center of this model because I cannot get my process to operate with the B factor at the zero level. It's undefined in the model. Okay, so I can only operate on this lower plane or on this upper plane, but there's nothing, I can't run a zero, zero point in terms of B. At best, what I can do is I can run a point over there and a point on that bottom face putting A and C at their zero, zero levels, keeping B either low or keeping B either high. Okay, so the approach we follow here is we run, for binary variables, you run a fractional or a full factorial. So in, in, if I was doing this, I would never run a full factorial right off the, off the start of this. This is my first set of experiments I'm doing. Now the three factors A, B, and C, I would for sure only run a fractional factorial. That way I'm doing half the number of experiments. Okay, so I would only do four experiments in A, B, and C. But if, I, if, if money wasn't an issue or these experiments could be done really quickly, for sure you would run a full factorial then. And what you do is you use the sign of the binary variable slope coefficient. To tell you what the optimum choice for the binary variable is. Okay, so for example, in this case, the slope coefficient would be B subscript B. And let's assume I'm trying to, to maximize y. Okay. Then I would choose the sign, or I would choose my b value of b either being low or b being high, depending on what b slope coefficient is, so that I could maximize y. And then I just keep that binary variable fixed at the, either the low level or the high level. So if B, B, B subscript B was a negative coefficient, I would then keep my B choice for the binary variable at the minus level as well. So I get minus, minus, times the minus gets me a plus. And then I would just run the rest of my experiments with B kept at its low level. <coughs> and in fact, then what happens is if I'm choosing B to run at the low level, this then essentially just becomes a response surface optimization in terms of factor A and C. So you, you've eliminated your B variable, your binary variable from consideration, and you continue your response surface in terms of factors A and C only. Those are the two continuous variables that you can and move around. And nine times out of ten, the correct answer to that question is profit. And you should be looking at profit. So, for example, dollars per day, or per kilogram, or whatever is appropriate to your system. The reason is. Let's take a look at the situation where you might choose to optimize production rates. Okay. Or, um, so just 
pure kilograms produced from your process. If you choose to maximize the production rate, as you go to higher production rates, it's clear that your utilities go up, you may need more labor to operate the process, and so those costs actually come into play as well. If you're only maximizing that production rate and not taking your costs into account to achieve that improved production, you're getting a false optimum. Okay, so almost always the correct choice of a Y variable is profit. But that's tough to do. In many cases, when we run our experiments, calculating profit at the experimental condition is not easy. It's not easy to quantify what the costs are often. Okay, so um, it does take a little bit of thought, but if possible, you should make your Y variable profit because that's the, the fairest way to judge to judge the optimum. I just wanted to also show a few other types of optimums that we, we see. Um, these are artificial examples, but they, in terms of the, the equations that they represent, but they do match what we see in chemical processes quite frequently. So here's the example we were just looking at. That's the response surface in three dimensions for that central composite design we just constructed. So back here in this neighborhood, so this neighborhood of this central composite design, that point 0.6 is my zero, 00 baseline. The optimum is somewhere here at positive temperature and negative substrate. If I visualize that surface, I just took, take that, that response surface and I coded it up like that, you can see the 3D surface is as follows. So there's positive substrate in this direction, positive temperature in that direction, so my optimum is over so here. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's this particular example. Um, here's another example we, we often see, it's, it's a saddle point. So if we take a look at it this way, if I were, by some coincidence, right here in the middle, my response surface would start to show I've got two optimums. I've got one optimum going up this direction and I've got one optimum going up that direction. Which one do I pick? Okay. I've got two points going down on either side. So whenever you get your cubes so that two of your points are pointing up and two points are down and you're somewhere in the middle over here, visualize this type of surface. Okay. It's called the saddle point. So that happens actually quite quite often. Um, it's a it's a local it's a local optimum if you're not careful. Uh, you may if you're not stepping far enough, you may you may consider this to be an optimum around you, depending on the noise in your Y variable. But um, the direction that you pick to go after that, so let's say you land up at the saddle point, it's hard to tell. You can't say ahead of time when you're on that saddle which direction is the best one to pick recognize that you may have to actually come back and let's say you decide to climb this direction, recognize that you may have to come back in the future and explore the other optimal direction as well because it's not, it's not apparent always where, which is the preferred way to go up. Here's another one, uh, it's, it's a rising ridge, so it's a very, very slow incline to the optimum. You, you can, your optimum from this direction but this direction going up that way is a very, very slow, gradual climb. So again, a lot of will depend on your noise in this Y variable. What are you optimizing? What is your response variable? Can you measure it without error or with low error? If there's a high degree of error, you may not actually recognize that this lead direction is slowly rising up um, on you. Though, if that is the case, you might ask, well, does it really matter? Um, if this is such a slow rise, it, as long as you're operating somewhere along that ridge, you're pretty much doing better than all operating off those, those lower edges. Some other examples are, um, here's exactly a stationary ridge. So this ridge is exactly flat. No matter which direction you go in, you're, you're pretty much the same value in all, all, in all directions. This is if you get a situation like this in practice, which also does happen, um, this is of tremendous benefit to you because you can pick any point along this to run at and guarantee one point will be easier to operate than the other. 
Okay, so it might be slightly cheaper to operate at one point than the other point, more energy efficient, maybe one point releases less carbon dioxide. Um, something is going to change in that direction, but from your quality perspective, what your Y variable is, it, it makes no difference where you, where you operate. But then we can then bring in some secondary variables to, to into consideration. Then finally, this was, um, this is, happens also quite, quite typically. Um, I've seen this happen in rotation processes where you're running and you're optimizing and optimizing and you take another step and you fall rapidly down. In that, we, many of our processes do operate sort of on that knife's edge, you say, or on the edge of the cliff where we can go just a little bit further and you get catastrophic failure or a drop off. So this was my evil choice for the response surface competition uh, three years ago when I ran 4C3. Um, but most students actually did find the optimum. A few students did um, fall over the edge because they were taking the big step sizes. Okay, so let's just... Uh, end of the class by just taking a general look at response surface and, wrap, and wrapping up the section. The general strategy is you start at your baseline and you either use a full or a fractional factorial. And you build a model. You in almost always will find your two factor interactions on are small and the main effects are the ones that dominate. So that allows you to climb the path of steepest descent. Now, I've shown you an example where there's only two variables, but this approach works just as well for three variables, four variables. Um, there's no, no, no limit really to the number of continuous variables. The only thing is, the rule is, if I use B A units in A and B B units in B, I need to use move B C units in C. Right? So everything is ratioed according to the other one. So usually, I pick one. Let me change, choose to change XA by one unit. Then I ratio B step accordingly and I ratio C, C step accordingly. Okay, in the way that we did in that uh, substrate temperature example. So for example, here, my slope coefficients told me for every one unit change in T, I needed to change minus P in S. Well, it's the same thing here. If I've got more than one variable, I change B A units in XA, and B units of X, B and B C units of X. Now if I find that one of those steps are too large, like let's say B A step takes me way off the region of operation that I can operate the process at, well instead of taking a full one unit change in B A, we'll just change, take a 25% step. You don't need to take a full step. Then everything else also ratios down. If I choose to take a 25% step in A, take 25% of B and 25% of C. So everything still remains in proportion. And you keep stepping and stepping until the response levels off. And then let's say at Y8 is where I peak. That's where I choose to run my new factorial. So if YA was my previous optimum, then then I can refit my factorial at that point and I, and I keep repeating until I climb, climb up the mountain. And as you climb up, curvature starts to show up, my two-factor interactions start to become important. That's telling me I need to fit quadratic terms to my model. So that's where I, that sense of composite design starts to come in. So I add quadratic terms in A, quadratic terms in B, and then I'm down to just using constant points to find my model. So usually you can get to your optimums in about 20 to 25 experiments, sometimes quite a bit less. And um, also I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next class and then wrap up the DOE section.